last class we had a technical issue oh, can you see my screen yes sir yes yes sir okay. yeah okay so last class we had some technical issue and uh, we had to stop and by the time i came to know that it has been resolved was like already i think 10 minutes and uh, many of the students had left so are you are you guys following what what we are doing in this course are is, are you guys trying anything uh, also have you thought about your projects do you want to discuss anything because the eval evaluation of this course will be on the on the projects or the term papers so you can you can discuss uh, even after the class you can come to the room number 110 in cccr anytime and uh, also before the class or after the class so <clears throat> yeah i think we left that transfer learning last time yeah i am audible right yes sir okay yeah so we we left at transfer learning last time and in transfer learning i was uh, talking about like so you have so you have task a and you have a task b <clears throat> so you would basically train the model on task a and use that model on task b i mean the only modification you would do is maybe remove the last layer or a couple of last like last few layers and then just tune based on those like those and just tune based on those uh, last few layers so if you have for example if you have trained a cat classifier with a lot of data you can you can apply it on the x ray classification problem and so there are so you would typically delete the last layer of the neural network and its weights and so the first option is so why you would need to do is this is because if you have small data set so you would keep all the other weights fixed and add a new last layer and initialize the new layer weights and feed the new data to the neural network to learn new weights the second option is if you have if you have enough data for the for the new model for the task b which is the task b so you can you can then basically train all the weights uh, as of option 2 <clears throat> and option 1 and 2 are called fine tuning and training on task a is called pre training so what are the scenarios when transfer learning makes sense so the first one is if task a and b have the same kind of input that is for example image or audio in the second example is if you have a lot of data for task a uh, you are transferring from and relatively less data for the task b you are transferring to and the third is if you are having a low level you are having low level features from task a which could be helpful in learning task b so we basic what we mean by this is that basically the initial few layers the weights of those initial few layers they will be uh, they would be learning low level features or they would be learning some kind of basic tasks like how to, how to identify different edges or curves which you can use for in general uh, for any task of that particular type so for example if you are having an image or you are having a audio uh, or you are having a sequence of images and now the next next topic is multitask learning so in so it, like it says that in transfer learning you have a sequential process wherein you learn from task a and then transfer that to the task b in multitask learning you start off simultaneously so you like you try 
you try to have a neural network do several things at the same time and then each of these tasks help uh, like hopefully help all the help all the other tasks as well for example if you want to build an object recognition system that detects pedestrians cars stop signs traffic lights so the the shape of the label or the target would be 4,m where 4m 4 is the number of classes and uh, which is and each one is a binary one so just 0 and 1 and m is your number of samples so your cost function the way it will change in this case is so you can see it uh, you have to divide by 1 by m or you have to divide by m so multiplying with 1 by m and then you take the uh, you take the sum of the uh, your loss function l so you compute the loss function between y hat and y so y hat here is the model predicted value y are the actual ground truth so you you uh, sum over all the different classes so i is uh, no for all the different num number of samples so i is from 1 to m and then you loop over all the classes also so j is from 1 to 4 and so in this in this example uh, and so your loss function is uh, similar to what we used in logistic regression the uh, so you you have minus of y into log of y hat minus 1 minus y into log of 1 minus y hat so this is the this is the loss function similar because it's a classification problem and you use this uh, just like just like we we used in the logistic regression and in this example we have we could have you could have trained four neural networks separately so those four neural networks could have separately classified for pedestrians and cars and stop signs and traffic lights but uh, uh, but if some of the earlier features can be so lot of different features uh, basic features can be shared uh, between these different types of objects then you can find that training one neural network doing four tasks that results in a better performance than training four completely separate neural networks so in multi class uh, multitask learning uh, will also work if y isn't complete uh, for some labels so for example if you are uh, if you do not know some some of your labels uh, or you do not you do not know what is the classification of of that particular object so you can like you are not sure or you are or the person who has labeled or the data set itself has has uh, this kind of nan values so in this case it will uh, do good with the missing data so the loss function can be modified in such a way that uh, it will be computed only for the cases where uh, where there is no nan value and it so basically uh, multitask learning makes sense when you are when the first first is so you are training on a set of tasks that that could benefit from having a shared shared low level feature so a uh, task for example we have pedestrians cars stop signs traffic lights you can think of in terms of atmospheric signs you can have a mesoscale convective system you can have uh, uh, you can have rain bands you can have cyclones you can have so you can have different things uh, that you want to classify and uh, so the second is so amount of data required for each task should be similar and the third is if you can train a big enough neural network to do well on the task so if you if you can train a big neural network the performance of multitask learning compared to splitting the tasks is better and transfer learning is most commonly or most often used uh, rather than multitask learning so then uh, yeah this is almost ending this uh, this course so which was on structuring machine learning projects and in the end it talks about what is end to end deep learning so some systems have multiple stages to implement and end to end deep learning system implements all these stages with a single neural network so for example in a speech recognition system 
you would uh, you would build odd features from audio and then uh, phonemes from features and then build words from phonemes and then you make the transcripts so this is a non end to end system whereas in an end to end deep learning system you would directly go from audio to transcript and end to end deep learning system gives more uh, gives the data more freedom it might not use uh, phonemes when training so you i mean you basically let the data decide the weights of the network or data decide what the model will be and uh, rather than rather than you deciding it for uh, for like or you doing a lot of manual work and to build an end to end data uh, end to end deep learning system that works well we need a big data set and if we have a small data set the ordinary implementation could just work fine so for example like if your data set is small then you can do something like image to face detection and then face detection to face recognition so and the so the practice for in practice the best approach is a second one for now and uh, the second implementation has two steps working well because it's harder to get a lot of pictures with people in front of camera than getting faces of people and compare them and <clears throat> yeah so yeah it, it would take the neural, neural network takes two faces as an input and outputs if the fa two faces are same person or not so that that would be in the uh, face recognition system and then there are some other examples that he discussed and this is the this is a summary of uh, whether to use an end to end deep learning system or not and uh, so there are some pros so for example the first is you let the data speak you don't you don't tinker with it and don't uh, manually uh, change or you don't interfere in the model and the second thing is you yeah so you there is less designing hand designing of the components needed and the cons are that you may need a large amount of data set and it might exclude some useful hand design components and to apply this you would have to answer the question that whether you have sufficient data to learn a function of the complexity needed to map x to y and uh, the second thing is so whether so you have to apply using machine learning or deep learning to learn some individual components and when applying supervised learning you should carefully choose what types of x to y mappings you want to learn depending upon the task you can get the data for so this all depends upon the application so th this is like not there, there are no such hard rules so it would all depend upon the kind of application you are having now okay so the last class we ended here and so today uh, so we so we have we are done with that with that theory part and we will we will see some uh, some coding examples now so going by the by the flow that we were following okay so we have in the in the past sessions we have seen some uh, beginner level uh, tutorials for tensor flow we have seen so if you see we have seen how to load the csv data set we have seen the beginner quick start tutorial and the keras basics tutorial now this is from the official tutorials uh, this is a tensor flow to quick start for experts so hoping that you guys are already have got some familiarity with the with the tensorflow syntax and codes so the first thing is we would basically uh, import the libraries uh, so we would import tensorflow stf and you import the various different layers from tensorflow.keras.layers uh, layers class which is which is there in the keras in tensorflow so we would take the dense flatten and con 2d and then also we would import the model class from tensorflow.keras 
So this is similar to I think uh, the examples that we have seen before, but this is a quick start for experts example. Okay. So this says that uh, TensorFlow version is 2.8. Now you so within TensorFlow dot keras dot datasets this MNIST dataset is already provided so we would access it from there and uh, this is the object of this MNIST class so you make the object call the function load data this will return training x train y train x test y test and what you would typically do is you would divide uh, so this is an image dataset which goes from 0 to 255 so you would divide uh, so you would do uh, max normalization and uh, if you run this for the first time this gets downloaded so if you want to see what is there in this in this data so you can see x x train dot shape so this is 60000 images of the size 28 by 28 and uh, you can see what is the type so this is a numpy array and uh, you can see that uh, we have artificially added one axis so this is like numpy so artificially added a tensorflow axis to this to this data which is why we are getting one extra axis here and this can be used as a channel for for the for for your input training your input and uh, so we basically divide the input x uh, with an x test and y test with uh, 255 and we will see what is there in y So y is basically just it has a size of 60,000 and let us see what is the type of y. Oh, sorry. Y train. Not y. So it's also a numpy array and uh, if you want to see maybe the first five elements of y, oh, y train. So you can see 501 50419. So MNIST, as we discussed previously, it's a data set of uh, images fr uh, from number so from numbers from 0 to 9. And uh, let us see if they show something. So you can see in this paper. Yeah, so not these actually, but yeah, these these ones. So <clears throat> you can see that this is the data set of these digits from uh, zero to nine. And uh, the task is that you would be given this image and the model has to classify or tell the number, actual number. Now, in this case, we will use the tf.data uh, class from, from TensorFlow. And uh, it is very easy to, to use tf.data. And it is actually recommended to use tf.data class because this will ensure that there are no memory leakages or no problems as you train your model. So how you, how you make a tf.data uh, uh, data set is using the using this function from tensor slices which is defined in tf.data.dataset so the first thing you have to give is a tuple which consists of x train comma y train and then you give a dot shuffle so this will basically shuffle so you if you see we have 60000 samples so this will shuffle like uh, and uh, so this will shuffle 10000 times and you take a batch size of 32 
and so similarly for the test data set you create this test underscore ds and that also you create using from tensor slices so we will we'll see that now uh, the next part is to create a, a tensorflow model so in our model we will so we will build build this model inherited from the so we if you remember we we imported this <coughs> model with an m capital from tensorflow.keras so we will make make an inherited model from this so we will say uh, we will we will pass this as an argument to this my model class and then we will uh, so we will basically instantiate this this model by by using so this is a super model and this is a child model this is a child of my model is a child of model so we will instantiate using dot uh, underscore in it underscore in it so after that you will define your layers so the first layer is we are we are having a scon one which is which is con 2d so if you see con 2d we had imported con 2d from tensorflow.keras.layers so you can see that so the first argument of con 2d is the number of filters so we are using 32 filters this will be a convolution so we have uh, not seen convolution we will we will see convolution is a is the next course in the course that we are following so then this is the kernel size so if uh, are you guys aware of convolution are you guys aware of convolution what is convolution what do i mean by kernel size is anybody listening am i yes. audible Yes, yes. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. So do you know convolution? It's okay if you don't know. I, that's what I'm trying to show. See, uh, okay. So if you have this, this image, okay. And, uh, so in convolution, what we have is we have a 2D input and we have a 2D output. Okay. No, not necessarily a 2D output, but you have a 2D input and the weight that weights that we are, we are, we were using in our deep neural networks, which was a, like, which was a scalar previously will also be a 2D. So this is a 2D weight which is going over. Uh, so you are doing the convolution operation over this over this 2d image and what you are basically doing is so this is all the whites are plus one all the blacks are minus one and in the center you have zero so this is a weight which is trying to identify the vertical edges and uh, what you do in a convolution is you just keep this weight over the image multiply all the numbers which are overlapping and then sum them up so that is known as a linear combination. So similar to the linear combination you do in a deep neural network, and then you apply the nonlinear activation. So the what we mean by kernel size here is the size of this filter, okay? And as many number of this filter we will use, that is the total number of uh, filters that that we will have. So this filter, hmm. so then you can see that uh, we can have different types of filters. So that is, so here in this con 2D, this is the number of filters. This is the kernel size, okay? And the activation that we are using is ReLU. So after this con 2D, what we would do is we would use this flatten layer. So we are creating an object flatten of the class flatten so flatten we we also imported uh, from tensorflow.keras.layers so you can see this and then we have d1 and d2 so d1 is the dense layer one 
which is having uh, an output of 128 nodes okay and then the activation is relu and d2 is having a uh, it's it's having so an output number of nodes is 10 so then uh, you would typically use you would typically use this function known as uh, and you would use the same name call and in the call you would give the arguments as so this is for the since this is in the class so you would have to give the self uh, argument and then it would also take x okay so what is this x so this x is something which is which will be passed to your uh, which will which will be used for for your model okay so then you can see that x equal to self dot con one so you you pass this x as an argument to this this con one also so after the convolution uh, you basically flatten uh, your sorry you basically flatten your uh, your data and then you apply the the first dense layer and then return the next dense layer so you can see we are we are inputting x outputting x inputting x outputting x so this is this basically becomes like a computational graph okay and now you can create an instance of the model so you can create an object of this class my model so we'll run this so now your your model has been has been created and then uh, so we'll see we'll see where this x is being passed but first let us create uh, maybe our optimizer and loss function so the loss function that we have here in this case is sparse categorical cross entropy so this sparse category categorical cross entropy i think we have seen in the previous classes as well so you can see yeah i think we have seen this so in it computes the cross entropy loss between labels and the predictions so even if your your uh, your y true is 1 comma 2 okay you don't need to convert your uh, or transform your your uh, ground truth to one hot encoding and if your prediction is in terms of probabilities 0 0.05 0 0.95 and 1 0 so this basically means uh, the this this is identifying class 2 this is also identifying it as a class 2 so your prediction is 1 comma 2 your target uh, your no, your actual ground truth is one comma two, and your prediction is two comma two. So you can compute this sparse categorical cross entropy loss, and uh, you can see more details about what this sparse categorical cross entropy loss. You can just go to wiki, and uh, or like we'll see from from here. So you can you can see that this is slightly different than the the cross entropy loss and okay so this this is yeah so sparse categorical cross entropy loss is similar so it says both categorical cross entropy and sparse categorical cross entropy have the same loss function the only difference is the format which you mentioned y that is the true levels if your y's are one hot encoded use categorical cross entropy so for example uh, if your y's are 1000011 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 but if your y's are integers use sparse categorical cross entropy okay and the usage entirely depends on how you load your data set one advantage of using sparse categorical cross entropy is it saves time in memory as well as computation because it simply uses a single integer for a class rather than the full vector so easier to use and uh, so we will use this sparse categorical cross entropy and the optimizer that we would use is adam so if you remember adam is a combination of rms prop and momentum and uh, yeah so the next thing is so we will select the metric uh, to measure the loss and accuracy of the model so the the metric so we will say okay so the training loss metric we will name as uh, so we will name as train underscore loss and the train accuracy we will is uh, sparse categorical accuracy and we will name it
accuracy. Similarly, this is the accuracy. So the next thing is we have to. So you should see the use of this TensorFlow dot gradient tape. Now this is this is actually very uh, very useful and. If you if you learn how to use this, like you can say that at least you know uh, some level of of TensorFlow. Okay, so I will show you the official page of this gradient tape. Okay, so it so this gradient tape it records operations for automatic differentiation, and the operations are recorded if they are executed with this context manager and at least one of the inputs is being watched so you can so for example the, there are these trainable variables which are created by tf dot variable or uh, and and are automatically watched so tensors can be manually watched by invoking the watch method so for example you consider the function y is equal to x square so y is equal to x into x the gradient at x equal to 3 is so dy by dx which is uh, which which will be so dy by dx is 2x so the gradient will be 6 okay it can be computed as so you say we define a tf dot constant x equal to tf dot constant 3 and you say with gradient tape so you you do a g dot watch with gradient tape as g so g dot watch x and uh, y is equal to x into x and you compute uh, dy by dx okay so you say dy by dx equal to g dot gradient y comma x and what it will return you so this is it will return you a dy underscore dx and the value you can see is six okay so then gradient tapes can be nested to compute higher order derivatives okay so you can you can say x, x equal to tf dot constant five and with gradient tape as g you watch x and with tf dot gradient tape as gg you watch also watch x so you say y is equal to x into x and uh, dy by dx is equal to gg dot gradient okay so this will this will compute your uh, uh, like it will uh, differentiate it once and d2y by dx square it will be g dot gradient so it will be a gradient dy by dx d so uh, d by dx or into d by so d by dx so that will be d2y by dx square so you can see your d2y by dx square is 2 dy by dx is uh, 10 in this case and by default the resources held by gradient tape are released as soon as gradient tape dot gradient method is called so to compute multiple gradients over the same computation create a persistent gradient tape this allows multiple calls to gradient method as resources are released when the tape object is garbage collected so for example uh, what they mean by this is that so if you you have again have x is a constant which whose value is 3 so you say with tf dot gradient tape persistent equal to true and so this will be to compute multiple gradients because he's saying that uh, the the resources held by gradient tape are lost as soon as gradient is called so with persistent that won't happen so you say as so tf dot gradient tape as g and you watch x so you have to basically this is x is the is the independent variable so you say y is equal to x square and z equal to y square so dz by dx so that will be uh, basically z is dependent on y and y is dependent on x so this this would basically be so g dot gradient z comma x and if you compute this so this will be dz by uh, dy into dy by dx right so you your value will be 108 and you you can do this again so you can compute dy by dx so you can see but this is possible only because persistent is true otherwise after doing uh, running this gradient uh, so g dot gradient you won't be able to do this because uh, if persistent is not true then the all the resources held by the gradient tape will be lost and so by default the gradient tape will automatically watch any training trainable variables 
that are accessed in the context. If you want fine grained control over which variables are watched, you can disable automatic tracking by passing watch access variables equal to false to the tape constructor. So you can say, for example, access to uh, W, which is a weight. So these are now variables. Previously, we were using TF dot constants. So you can see these are now variables. So their values can change. And uh, with TF dot gradient tape, so you say watch accessed variables equal to false, persistent equal to true as tape. And you say tape uh, tape dot watch x. So you watch, you're watching basically x. And y is equal to x square, z equal to w cube. And uh, you can compute dy by dx. So as tape dot gradient y comma x. And then you can compute uh, dz by dw. So dz by dy. Okay, so that will be dz by dy will be dz by dw and, and dw by, okay. So basically you don't have a relationship first and you are not watching w, okay. So this will, this will, this can't give you, give you anything. And now you have to note that when using models, you should ensure that your variables exist when using watch access variable size equal to false. So, uh, for example, otherwise it's quite an easy task to make your first iteration not have any gradient. So a is equal to tf dot keras dot layers dot dense. So this will be having an output of so this will be having 32 nodes at the output. And this is a another layer that you define with 32 nodes. And then you say so with tf dot gradient uh, gradient tape watch access variables as false equal to false as tape and you watch a dot variables and you say result equal to b and uh, within b you pass a and uh, as an argument and then uh, you pass inputs so you pass inputs to a and then you pass a to b and that is that is your uh, that is your result and if you want to compute the gradients, so the grade, so this will be your, uh, this will be your final value. And then, so if you want to compute gradient, you can consider this to be something like a loss function. So you can say tape dot gradient result comma a dot variable. So the result of this computation will be a list of none since a a's variables are not being watched. Uh, since a has not been called. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So that's that's about gradient tape, and uh, with gradient tape you can you can basically compute gradient. You can compute Jacobian, and you can do all different sorts of things. So this makes uh, doing calculus very easy. So in this case, you can see here. Uh, so also uh, you should know what are decorators. What are you taught? What are decorators in Python? What you taught? What are decorators in Python? Okay. So basically, a decorator. I had seen a very good uh, explanation of a decorator, and it's it's slightly like. Uh, if you have been taught, I will not cover that. Otherwise, you can let me know. Have you been taught dec decorators in Python? No, sir. In Python functions. Okay. No, sir. No, sir. Okay, okay. So, so decorator is something uh, like, for example, if you have a function. Okay, so if you have this uh, method, okay which is defined as def my method and then you are having these arguments and you are returning something. So you can say at the rate decorator one. So this at the rate decorate, so decorator one and you can say at the rate decorator two. So now this decorator two and decorator one are also functions. So if you if you apply, apply at the rate uh, some function above a function, 
so it would be basically this uh, this is basically wrapping this as so you are applying this decorator one function to my method and then you are applying decorator two function to decorator one and then to my method okay so to make it easier um, let us see if we have some examples okay so you can see here that uh, decorator one is a function right and uh, decorator two is also a function right so okay so what you can do is you can decorate this function num with decor one and decor two okay and what this decor one and so this decor function it takes an argument as a function okay and that function is this num function so you are basically passing this function as an argument to the function decor and to the function decor one you are passing the argument as decor uh, which will also have an argument of the function num so when you when you print num it would it would apply or both this decor one and decor two to num and then print out okay so let's say here you have uh, if you just if you just printed num it would return 10 right so it would it should actually predict uh, print 10 but what it is what it is doing is it is applying this decorator decor so what this decor decorator does is Okay, so it takes a, an input as a function num and uh, it has got an inner function. So x equal to func and uh, so x equal to func is basically this num function and uh, the value that will be returned from the num will be 10. So the value of x is 10 and you are returning 2 into 10. So that will be 20. So this inner function returns 20 return inner. So this decor function after this decor the value uh, that is written is 20 uh, and then you pass this uh, you pass this decor one so the value that is returned from decor is 20 and then you pass this decor uh, so now you apply the decorator decor one to to this entire thing okay so this is the this is the input so this is a function argument to this decor one and then you say here uh, so the input is function and then it has also got an inner function so this this func will be this this entire thing and what it will return you have seen it it is so the value of x is 20 and this will return 20 into 20 so that will be what uh, so that that is what is returned so that is how you can see 20 into 20 is 400 I mean, did it did it make slightly clear what is a decorator? And I mean, with very less amount of code, you can you can do a lot of things with this uh, with this decorator in Python. Okay. So yeah, so we are decorating this function train step with the with the function tf dot function. Okay. So tf dot function we will we will maybe see the okay so it says that tf dot function compiles a function into a callable TensorFlow graph so if you pass any function to tf dot function it basically makes it into a computational graph and uh, you can so it basically constructs a tf dot types dot experimental generic function that executes tensorflow graph uh, which is tf dot graph created by trace compiling the tensorflow operations in func so more information can be found in this one and uh, so you can see that here also they have decorated this function f 
with tf dot function so you can see so x and y so x is a constant 2 comma 3 y is also a constant and f x comma y so then this this basically so this was this was not at all related to tensorflow but now you have by adding a decorator tf dot function you have created a computational graph so you can see the type of this so tf dot tensor and uh, so that is the output of f of x comma y so that so you you create this kind of tf dot function computational graphs which can be then used by tensorflow so we we decorate this function train step which takes in the inputs image images and labels what are your images and labels so your images are x train and your labels are y train and uh, you say with tf dot gradient tape as tape so we would we are basically recording the uh, we are we are recording the the gradients and uh, so we are find so we will say predictions equal to model images comma training equal to true so you are saying training equal to true because we are training otherwise at the test time and evaluation we won't give this or we would say training equal to uh, false so you see we had we had defined our model here okay and our model takes what does it take so you can you have to see it uh, you pass this x to the model so here you are passing images so images is the input to the model on which first you will apply convolution then flatten layer then dense layer 1 dense layer 2 so once your predictions have been created you find out the loss so what is your loss so you will uh, you will have to provide your labels and your predictions so labels are your ground truth you had created this loss object okay so which is sparse categorical cross entropy and you would pass the labels and your prediction to your loss object and then you would say so you would compute the you would compute the gradients so you would say gradients equal to tape dot gradient you uh, compute the derivative of this loss with respect to all the weights in the model okay and then you say optimizer so you then so you have now you have basically computed all the gradients so you would apply gradient descent and uh, so that is what our optimizer does so you would you would basically use the adam optimizer so if you remember we were talking about so how will you do the gradient descent so w equal to w minus alpha into del of l by del of w so you apply you say you run, call this function dot apply gradients and you zip the gradients and model trainable variables so this will basically compute your updated weights and then you compute the uh, so so with this then you compute the train loss so which is which is this one okay so you compute your loss and you compute your accuracy so for accuracy you would need your your labels and predictions and for training loss so this will compute a mean loss over all the examples okay so we run this we've seen what this function does and then we have the test step so in the test step what you have is uh, you basically say again you decorate it with tf dot function and you create this test underscore step function with the arguments as images and labels so the now you first uh, compute the prediction so you pass the images to the model and then you compute the test loss so you, again you will say loss object you will give the labels and the prediction and then you will compute test loss and test accuracy okay so we would say that the uh, we would keep the number of epochs is 5 so for five times we will run over all the examples all these samples so you have this now loop for epoch in range capital epochs so first thing you would do is train loss dot reset state so you, this train loss that you defined here so you would at the beginning of each epoch you would first clean that you would not uh, like to we would not like to keep any values in that from the previous epoch 
So you clean all clean train loss, train accuracy, test loss, test accuracy, and then for images, comma labels in the train DS. So train DS is your uh, TF dot data data set. Okay. So train DS and test test DS. So these are of the data data type uh, TF dot data. So you you loop over uh, train DS and then you call this function train step. Okay. So train step if you call this function gets called and then which which does training over all the all the samples and then you for the test images. So again you call the test step. So at this time now your weights are not getting updated. So the training is false and now you would uh, so what we would do here is so you can see in the optimizer we are using uh, so you are basically computing your loss basing based on sparse categorical uh, cross entropy. One very important thing to note is that this train loss and train accuracy you are just computing to monitor the loss, but you are trying to optimize your model on the uh, on this sparse categorical cross entropy. So which is your loss object. So you are after that you just uh, you just print your epoch loss accuracy test loss test accuracy so we will run this model Okay, so you can see that we have reached a test accuracy of 98.15% and uh, yeah, that's all about this example. This was like one of the most detailed uh, codes like using using standard Keras. You will you will not see a lot of these steps which you actually saw. And uh, these are very important to understand if you want to build custom models. So I can see it's 255. And let us see if we can do another example. Okay, so. This is, I think, yeah, this is small. We can try this. So, this is an introductory TensorFlow tutorial that shows how to import the required package, create and use tensors, use GPU acceleration, and it demonstrates TF dot data data set. So, you import the import TensorFlow. Okay, so what is a tensor? A tensor is a multi-dimensional array similar to NumPy ND array objects, uh, and have, which have the same, which have a data type and shape. Additionally, TF dot tensor can reside in an accelerator memory like a GPU, and it offers a rich library of operations like TF dot add, mat matrix multiplication, and uh, uh, matrix inverse from the tf dot linear algebra library that consume and produce tf dot tensors so you can see you can add one comma two you can add these two matrices you can square a number you can basically do whatever you can do in numpy but it will take in as an input as a tf dot tensor or it can even like here you can see it's inputting standard uh, python integers so it can but it will output a tf dot tensor so each tf dot tensor has got a shape and a type so if you multiply if you do a matrix multiplication of one and uh, two so so you multiply these two matrices so you see you print this so the this is two three and the shape is one comma two data type is ant the most common difference between them are so tensors can be 
backed by accelerated memory and tensors are immutable so if you would have done the concept of mutable and immutable lists in uh, while while learning python so tensors are tensors are immutable and uh, converting between tensorflow and numpy and dra is easy uh, tensorflow tensor and numpy and dra and because so you can you can do tensorflow operations automatically to convert numpy and dras to tensors and numpy operations automatically convert tensors to numpy arrays uh, so we'll see how to do that so for example this is an a numpy nd array np dot ones so it has a size of 3 by 3 and all numbers are ones so you can now tensorflow operations convert numpy arrays to tensorflow automatically so you see if you multiply this nd array with 42 and you print the tensor so it should create okay so you see all are 42 and then you add you say np dot add tensor comma one so now add numpy operations convert tensors to numpy automatically and dot numpy method explicitly converts a tensor to numpy now uh, many tensorflow operations require gpus so tensorflow automatically decides whether to use gpu or cpu copying the tensor between gpu and cpu memory and tensors produced by an operation are typically backed by a memory by the memory of the of the device on which the operation is executed for example so this x is so this this x is uh, is a random uh, is a matrix of size 3 by 3 which is created by a random number generator from tensorflow and then it will check whether a gpu is available so then this will print whether the gpu is available and it will check if the tensor is on gpu so is the so you see tf.config.list physical devices gpu uh, is the gpu available so this is the name of the physical device so we are on collab pro so we have a gpu is the tensor on gpu number zero and this x dot device ends with gpu colon zero yeah true so x is on gpu and uh, so device names so tensor device property provides a fully qualified string name of the device hosting the tensor so this name encodes many details such as identifier of a network address or the host on which the program is executing and the device within the host so this is required for distributed execution of tensorflow program and the string ends with gpu colon and uh, this number n so if the tensor is placed on nth gpu uh, so if it will be gpu colon n if it is placed on the nth gpu and uh, you can explicitly place uh, place the tensor over a particular device so you can say x dot device dot ends with uh, you can say cpu colon zero or you can force the device on a particular particular gpu and then there are there are this tf dot data dot data set uh, data structure uh, that that we have already seen okay so you can create that from using the function from tensor slices so maybe let's try to run this and you can you can then also apply different uh, functions and you can use the map function and shuffle to basically shuffle and uh, use so this map function basically applies this function to the ds underscore tensors and uh, you can you can basically it's very easy to iterate over a tf dot data data set so yeah we can see this so for for x in ds underscore tensors print x so first you see it's printing 1 comma 9 then it is printing 16 25 then it is printing 4 comma 34 and this is because we have kept the batch sizes 2 and our total number of elements i think is 6 so this shuffles uh, like in shuffles them like uh, twice and then batch size is 2 so yeah and then this is this is being done for the this kind of string uh, arrays as well so yeah it's 3 pm today and uh, i am having some meeting so we will we will end it here from the from the next class we will again uh, make it 